Hello, today I'm going to be talking about Final Fantasy VIII. Now, Final Fantasy VIII is a game that profoundly changed my idea about what video games could achieve and be, and also to what extent they can really be held up and regarded as an art form, you know, art with a capital A. Uh, as such, this isn't a discourse designed to be a conventional review or an objective retrospective account of the game, but rather it's a concerted effort on my part to try and provide a slightly more thorough analysis of what I what I believe to be a very complex and multifaceted game and a very important contribution to, you know, gaming history at large, particularly the the uh, conventional RPG format. Now, before I get into talking about Final Fantasy VIII proper, I need to draw attention to this and I think, you know, it may well be immediately obvious to anyone listening to this because I, I personally think that Final Fantasy VIII is one of the the less talked about games of, of you know this series and I find this controversy you know I think we can qu quite you know realistically call it controversy I find it quite interesting and you know it's something that I think warrants addressing before we get into it properly as most Final Fantasy fans know uh, Squaresoft or Square Enix is a company that really likes to push boundaries and reinvent virtually every aspect of the universe of the, of the Final Fantasy uh, series for each numerical instalment. And what this does is makes Final Fantasy as a brand, as a title, only a very loosely interconnected series of elements you know, that, that are consistent through each numerical instalment. So, for example, we have Chocobos, which are a staple. We have a character named Sid, which is a staple. We have Gil as a currency, which is a staple. But it's only these kind of fleeting instances that hold fast throughout each game. And now, as you know, time and technology moves on, we're seeing this even, even more kind of being whittled away. We're being lifted even further out of the traditional JRPG format, wherein, you know, for example, in Final Fantasy X, we lost the explorable world map, and we're gradually seeing the decline of the turn-based battle system, which, you know, started getting lost around Final Fantasy XII, I'd say. Now. The reason for this continued pushing of the envelope on the part of Square is, of course, to keep the games fresh and innovative every time we turn to them. But an interesting side effect that we've seen over the years is the quite dramatic split this causes between fans of the games. It's it's not an uncommon sight to see comments on forums or YouTube along the lines of, I think 7, 8 and 9 are the best, or 7, 9 and 10 are the best, or 9 was the only game that truly returned to the roots of what Final Fantasy is, you know, etc. And this differing of opinion I put largely, but not exclusively, down to a generational divide, because I think anyone from the NES generation who loved and revered the early instalments would perhaps be a bit put off by all the steampunk and futuristic elements that would be introduced in 6 onwards. Uh, similarly, I think it would be hard to expect someone growing up used to the graphics of the PlayStation 2 era to really kind of go back and play you know, Final Fantasy 7 and really kind of appreciate what a milestone in gaming history that was, I think it would be quite hard for them to appreciate that, which is probably in part why everyone wants a, a remake of that game. But this inside, th this aside, I think, you know, by and large, Final Fantasy fans are quite receptive of one another's opinions because, you know, we all love the series and that's why, you know, we're sort of here, um, you know, you know, discoursing and talking about them, which is, you know, great, you know. But for my part, the reason I'm mentioning this now is I've long been at the butt end of this controversy because... Although it's a very tight tie for me, and up until about you know ten, I do kind of love these games. But uh, you know, the, the Final Fantasy VIII always seems to win out for me. It's a very tight tie between <clears throat> the um, PlayStation One generation Final Fantasies, so you know um, seven to nine, and the re-release of six. But you know, Final Fantasy VIII is does always come out on top for me, and in many ways, this this clip is also basically my two cents worth to try and convey precisely, you know, why that is and my feelings pertaining to why this game is such, you know, a fantastic contribution to this series. Now, I think it has to be said that in 1999, off the back of Final Fantasy VII, one of the first things that immediately set Final Fantasy VIII apart was its looks. You know, it was very distinct from its predecessor because straight away we see what amounts to a beautifully rendered graphical powerhouse by 1999 standards. The game looks absolutely fantastic and the opening montage of Squall fighting Cypher against the Libari Fatali soundtrack is it still stands up for me as one of the best 
opening and you know video game openings I've ever seen. There's a much more cinematic, epic quality to this game, and we see this through scenes such as you know of course the opening, uh, the landing on uh, Dolly Beach, and Paul Squall's at attack on the sorceress at Delling City after Irvin fails to assassinate her, and this sort of action-based, very fast, kind of fluid animation, it, it, it simply wasn't achievable before. I mean, if we think back to the the motorbike scene in, in Final Fantasy VII, which is an incredibly famous, you know, uh, scene because it was so action-based and awesome and, you know, Cloud has a motorbike. But if we, if we kind of set it aside Final Fantasy VIII, we can really see how very clunky that was. Um, I'm not knocking Final Fantasy VII, of course, it was just the difference in technology at the time and what they had available. I mean, the the opening of eight, it just wouldn't have had the same impact if it had the clunky, the clunkiness of seven's FMVs and the, the animation quality, and neither would the the dance scene with Rhinoa for that matter. I mean, can you imagine how how really very bad that would look, you know, if it had Final Fantasy seven's graphics? So, you know, I'm not knocking seven at all. I'm just, you know, I just I think straight off this was an an immediately apparent difference with with eight they really stepped up the game and they were they were able to utilize this technology to a much to a much higher standard the in-game field graphics are also in my opinion vastly approved over sevens the most profound break we see from earlier ff installments is the effort to produce realistically proportioned characters some people can test this and think the more abstract field graphics of seven and nine are better and of course I'm fine with that opinion and I did actually really like Final Fantasy IX's graphics because for that particular universe, that particular Final Fantasy world, it worked perfectly and an attempt at figurative realism you know, in Final Fantasy IX just wouldn't work as well as it did in, in Final Fantasy VIII. And uniquely as well, the, the field character avatars don't disappear into the main character when you're running around in the, in the field screen, but they actually, they actually follow him around. And this offers a degree of authenticity while the game's being played out. And I personally really love this aspect of the game. And I think it actually relates to one of the key themes that I'm going to explore later. And that's the idea of camaraderie and kind of togetherness. And as a result, even when you're kind of doing the dungeons and the deep sea research, you know, laboratories, you know, just kind of, you know, quite is isolated kind of, uh, you know, dramatic, kind of environments like that you don't feel alienated or alone because you know you have your party with you at least you know that's the response it kind of elicits from me so even though you know that the um the characters following you around is purely decorative i mean you can't you can't interact with them or anything i just i just think it kind of it adds a really nice touch to final fantasy 8 which was you know very overtly trying to be more authentic and realistic and serious as well, I think, than than any Final Fantasy that we'd really seen to date. In terms of graphics, however, the, the series does maintain the the pre-painted backgrounds for their locations, which is something I really love, and it's actually, you know, an aspect of these these early Final Fantasies that I, I really do like. Anyway, on a purely subjective note, this is my favourite world of all the Final Fantasies, and you know, particularly of the PS1 generation. And the reason for this is the entire feeling of the game and its respective towns is is bright and fragrant and despite the political turbulence and the, the crazy sorceress and everything it's really quite optimistic I find you know if we compare it to Final Fantasy 7 which had Midgar and Junon and you know this music on the world map which permeated a, a sense of the apocalypse coming you know it was very doom and gloom that game and also Final Fantasy 9 which had you know mist all across the world and it was a very grim reminder that you know there was the monsters and the unknown at every turn Final Fantasy VIII by comparison had lovely bright terrains and a lot of the uh, towns and cities and environments w had this classic European beauty to them so for example the streets of Dole which I believe were modelled on the streets of southern France and I think actually etymologically uh, Dole is a French word which is why I say Dole and not Dolit which I've heard some people call it but you know, I'm not sure what the, the true pronunciation of that is. And um, and also, you know, Balham Town as well, which has that lovely seaside feel to it. And, you know, I'm, I'm quite an optimistic person, so <laughs> I tend to lean towards more optimistic environs, I suppose. In fact, the only real gripe I had with any of the environments or aspects of the world in this game was at the beginning of Disc 3 when you have to find the White Seed ship, uh, because that was just very trying for me. <laughs> That's the only thing I don't like about this world map. Lastly, regarding the world of Final Fantasy VIII, 
I think it's worth mentioning, and it's only a tiny addition, but I personally really like this, and that's the fact that there's an active train service that goes across the world. I'm not sure why I love this so much, but I think it's just awesome, and it's not something that we've really seen on Final Fantasy World maps before. And it, it's not just that it's, it's a nice kind of a decorative touch, but it's the fact it's decorative and interactive, and it's necessary to pr propel the storyline forwards, at least you know early in the game. So it really compounds the relevance for the, the train tracks being there. And I, I personally, I mean, this is just speculation, but I think the trains were, you know, perhaps introduced to divorce the game from Final Fantasy VII, which was very chocobo orientated, you know, as a mo as an initial mode of transport. And if Final Fantasy VIII were to keep going with this the chocobo thing, there might be some very um, unsavoury comparisons to make, um, you know, because Final Fantasy VII was so famous, I think they really had to avoid the criticism that they were you know making this game a carbon copy of final fantasy 7 and it's you know i think really they were in a situation they just couldn't win you know off the back of a, such a milestone game in fact just digressing very quickly on the chocobo point i actually think you can go through this entire game without actually seeing one i mean I th you see one in windhill when you're laguna and you also see it as a part of the the uh, confused magic animation but apart from that they're just really not you know, a uh, necessity of this game unless you go ahead and do the side quests in the Chocobo Forests, which I find really quite interesting considering, you know, up until this point they've been a very significant aspect of the Final Fantasy franchise. So yeah, uh, the, tr the trains were really good for me and the only drawback I feel is that we don't get to use them enough and I think there's only two or three missions at the beginning of the game where you use them by necessity and after that the practicality of taking the train anywhere uh, drops off pretty, pretty sharply. Anyway, moving on from this surface level stuff and getting right to the heart of this game and the artistic genius that I perceive it to have, I want to go ahead and talk about themes. And I'm going to go over these very quickly before I get into the broader narrative construction of the game, because I'll be highlighting points where these themes are, you know, explored. And, you know, by establishing the themes first, you know, it can be a con contextual foundation and reference point by which we can consider the rest of the game. Now... One of the reasons Final Fantasy games, and for me this game in particular, are so important is that they often touch thematically on something quite deep and intangible and some really quite authentic and relatable facet of human experience. And like all great art, you know, they manage to encapsulate and hold a mirror up about some aspect of being that transcends all this decorative otherworldliness of Terra or Gaia or Spira or where, wherever we happen to be. And you know, there, there's something in these games that's directly relatable to us as human beings and as an audience. And I feel that Final Fantasy VIII is one of the best examples of video games I've played that touches on this, this more intangible, you know, artistic sort of feeling. Firstly, and this is a more subjective, it's not really a theme, it's more a um, narrative sort of element. And it's very subjective, you know, the, the reason why this kind of uh, made me like the game. But on the surface, and in a very general way, it is a coming-of-age tale, and it's seen through the eyes of a teenage protagonist. And going back to the generational thing that I mentioned, my personal introduction to Final Fantasy VIII was when I was myself on the cusp of being a teenager. So I think perhaps the story resonated a little more strongly with me than the psychologically dense and quite convoluted story of you know, Cloud in Seven, for example. And I feel that this may be a correlative thing with people that consider Final Fantasy VIII the best game of the lot. It may have just, you know, the, the timing just may have been there with them and how they were feeling at the time and how, you know, the events of this game unfold. But beyond this, and now that I'm older and have returned to the game numerous times, I've found that it exhibits some really quite touching and, and overtly tragic, really, themes about what it is to be human. There's something existential about the game in that the overriding themes are firstly the concept of time and the finite nature of time and the idea of life as a as a limited thing and this is something that we haven't really seen or had discussed in depth in any other final fantasy for example in final fantasy 7 we have the death of ares which is a tragic death in a very cinematic sense but because the universe of final fantasy 7 has the life stream and it's governed by a very buddhist notion of reincarnation where in this universe it's a literal reincarnation. I mean, Ares goes into the life stream and becomes spirit energy, as Bugenhagen calls it, and you know comes back as energy, or you know as Bugenhagen says this in the 
in Cosmic Canyon, you have a tree, you know, people, people regenerate and they become a part of the earth. And where, for example, in Final Fantasy X, the dead get sent to the far plane, there's, in both of these examples, there's, a, there's comfort in the fact that death is not the end. And there's a very cyclical process and, at the very least, an endurance of one's presence that, that consoles the living. Now, Final Fantasy VIII, by example, by comparison, sorry, takes for a theme a very brutal concept of time as finite and life as finite. And this is exhibited in numerous ways, and perhaps most obviously by the desperation with which we see Alone trying to change the past by sending Squall and friends back to inhabit L Laguna's memories. You know, she does this in an effort to try and alter events so that Laguna doesn't leave rain behind. And again, you know, of course, we have the main antagonist, Ultimecia, and she's striving to achieve time compression, which is, of course, you know, without having time existing as a measurement of past, present and future, without having time as a dimension, there can be no birth, but most importantly for Ultimecia, there can be no death. One becomes the master of death and is anchored to a perpetual existence. So it exhibits a very profound sort of fear of death on the part of Ultimecia, and both of these examples highlight for me, you know, and, and they're very significant plot points as well, so it highlights for me how this game does seem to hinge very strongly on this idea of time. Another theme that I feel comes across very strongly in Final Fantasy VIII, and it complements the idea of, of time as well, is the plight of the self and the pursuit of the individual to find meaning in life in the time that is given to us. This of course comes across most strongly through Squall because we spend the most time with him and he's the main protagonist, but in my opinion it's no accident that the main characters of this game are all orphans. They've all been thrust into a, the world without roots, without an anchor to any given person or family or thing. And so each is confronted with the need to reconcile themselves within the world at large and to try and find a place to belong and be. And it really makes for some interesting, albeit kind of subtle narrative developments that I'll go on to you know, talk about later with these characters. The final theme that I found very impactful in this game, and it's largely used and posited as an antidote to the plight of the self, is an idea pertaining to the necessity of human relationships, you know, the togetherness and the opening of the heart to other other people and finding solace and communion in, in communion with other people. And of course the main story arc for this message is Squall and Rhinoa in overtly a r romantic sense. But I feel the camaraderie which grows between the party members in general as the game goes on shows how even platonic relationships you know, can can prove can prove a, a reason to be, and this is what grounds them at the end of the game. This is in fact what saves them from time compression, their commitment to one another. Likewise, even Laguna finds his raison d'être in helping Esfar, and finally being reunited with Kiros and Ward. And by the end of the game, even a character like Cipher, who's very cloistered and you know Machiavellian through most of this game, is finally seen to be a true and contented companion of Rajin and Fujin. And I feel this is actually, you know, one of the more powerful yet subtle redemption tales and facets of human camaraderie that we that we see in this game. Now, Final Fantasy VIII differs from other Final Fantasy games in numerous ways, and as I'm sure you're aware, for each Final Fantasy, the game worlds are distinguished by their own customs, principles, and mythologies. So, for example, where Seven operates in a universe where a corporate conglomerate holds sway over pretty much everything and Final Fantasy IX operates in a quasi-medieval universe where knights and mages are running around. Final Fantasy VIII operates in a universe which fuses profound technological advancement and you know, political turmoil with more archaic and mystical remnants from ages past in the form of sorceresses and planetary fluctuations that bring monsters raining down from the moon. Now, one of the, one of the massive bonuses, I think, about this sort of mythology around Final Fantasy VIII and the universe of Final Fantasy VIII is that, you know, if you're not interested in it, you can you can quite happily play through this game and just appreciate its graphical qualities and the JRPG, you know, format of it. But if you are interested in finding out more about, say, you know, the, the politics or Galbadia or the sorceresses and more obscure, you know, references, you know, throughout this game, such as, you know, Great Hine, you know, the god that created the sorceresses, there is a wealth of information to be gathered from MP NPCs and items around the world. And for me, this just illustrates Square's commitment to expanding beyond mere gameplay and creating a fleshed out world. Now, it's arguable that, you know, all Final Fantasies do this, and they do to an extent, 
but I feel that Final Fantasy VIII just really goes above and beyond with this, you know, with the embellishment of, of the world and the mythology, even more so than games like Seven and Nine, which, you know, we're more informed about them now from supplements and sequels and prequels and that sort of thing. But Final Fantasy VIII, you know, it throws throws it all in there and it really creates an authentic feeling, feeling about this world. Just digressing slightly on this point, one of the massive benefits I really like about this game is that hidden away in the uh, in the, the menu screen, in the tutorial panel, there's actually an information button. And this is really cool because, you know, you can find out, you know, as you discover th places and people throughout the game, you can find out more about them. It has a little kind of paragraph of information about them. So. For example, you can find out that Rhinoa's mother, Julia, died in a car crash at the age of 28. You find out more about, you know, the White Seeds ship, um, more about Maya Dobe, you know, just these obscure characters. But it really, you know, and I, I think I think the reason they kind of were able to put this in is the fact that you're a student and you're a mercenary. And one of the goals of Seed is to go around the world and find out more about the world in a very, you know, diplomatic and educational sense. So there's a reason for that being there. And it was just a great use of... The, the space that they had, you know, in this game, you know, they I think it was a it was a good use of disk space putting in, you know, this little info bar, and it really helps tie up perhaps some of the the looser the looser plot elements or character elements that we have in this game. And you you've got to remember that you know the internet was around in 1999, but it wasn't something. I mean, I don't personally remember using it. You didn't have Wikipedia, you didn't have, I mean, Google may have been around then, but you know, I I don't recall using it. So there was, you couldn't really you know, catch yourself up and get more informed about the game universe. You had to rely on what was there, what was on the disc. I think it's also crucial to mention here regarding the Final Fantasy VIII universe. And, you know, for this we have to kind of put ourselves back in the context of the time. Is the fact that it's not Final Fantasy VII. And this is incredibly important, and it's more important than it sounds now, because, you know, the, so much more has, has come out since then. But if we try and cast our minds back to what a massive and unprecedented success Final Fantasy VII was for Square, it must have been incredibly difficult for them not to simply, you know, follow follow the money trail, as it were, and create a carbon copy of that game. Or even worse, you know, it must have been incredibly difficult to come up with something completely divorced from everything that Final Fantasy VII was. So... You know, it, with this, regardless of your opinion of Final Fantasy VIII, I think it's commendable that you can set these two games beside one another, look at the world, look at the characters, the aesthetics and the story, and appreciate that they are completely different from one another. So, Final Fantasy VIII's world is partitioned up into three continents, and by the start of the game, the key civilization in terms of plot, which is undoubtedly Galbadia, is instigating a war of conquest against pretty much you know, the entire rest of the world. And this is this is a cool plot element, I think, because despite, you know, us being in a completely fictional world and a fictional setting, the bullying geopolitical tactics of, you know, this totalitarian government introduces a very familiar scenario and frame of reference for a, you know, a real world audience. And anyone with even a cursory knowledge of real world history can appreciate that, you know, these are the bad guys even before we're properly introduced to them. We take control of Squall, who's a recent graduate of the Elite Mercenary Academy Garden, and this prompts our introduction and involvement with the you know socio-political you know events of the game and the turmoil that follows. And although all this Mercenary Academy and political stuff is basically you know just a backdrop for the aforementioned themes of time, self, and togetherness to be explored, it's actually a very good and very consistent narrative arc, and it stands up for me. And and to be honest, it reads and unfolds and develops a lot better than you know, some novels that I've read and a lot of films that I've seen, which is a testament to the medium of video games, really. For example, you know, rather than confronting or understanding who Galbadia are straight away, we're first introduced to towns and people who are under occupation, you know, uh, uh, such as Timber, and this develops the idea of the sort of people that we're dealing with, rather than just explaining in a preamble, you know, that they're bad or why they're bad, uh, or showing us Vinza de Ling as an outward tyrant from the beginning. In fact, you know, Vinza de Ling's a perfect example because our first, you know, fleeting glimpse of him is with him delivering a strategic, strategically worded speech at Timber talking about, you know, trifling issues with other nations, you know, completely sidestepping his accountability as the aggressor. So, you know, this kind of political duplicitousness is, uh, really kind of drives home, the, you know, the, the kind of intelligence that this story, this story has and the, the act of showing and not telling that, you know, Square employs here. Now, going back to the Garden Academy thing, I also really like the concept of Garden and, you know, as a, as a as a aspect of this universe and this, this game world. 
and I think the fact it's a school for mercenaries is really, you know, a good a good plot device because as mercenaries by their nature are emotionally divorced and ideologically divorced from the events they encounter, you know, they're driven solely by money and self-gain. This is a perfect profession to have someone like Squall in as our protagonist because obviously he, he starts off in a very cloistered emotional state and he doesn't care about anyone else. So his profession sort of mirrors you know, his his personality. And then, you know, the, the game unfolds and develops accordingly, you know, to bring him out of that. But I think, you know, it was very, it was very well thought out. Furthermore, relating back to the first theme that I mentioned of time, the Mercenary Academy and, you know, the terminology used here, the fact it's called Garden, and at the start of the game you graduate and become what's known as Seed, the symbolism of the terminology here is loaded because, of course, a seed is you know, it's something that grows and blooms, and we're introduced, albeit very subtly, to this coming-of-age sort of tale, and also the time-based idea of life and death, you know, right at the beginning. In terms of narrative, the way that the plot plays out and unravels is absolutely brilliant, you know, because we start off in a small, straightforward microcosm of existence. You know, Squall needs to graduate his seed exam by going to Dole and helping to secure the town. We're thrown into these events, we don't really know what's going on, he doesn't really know what's going on, and it's ambiguous. But then gradually the plot opens out, you know, it unfolds, and we're introduced to the macrocosm, you know, what's really going on. And then we, we in turn become the centre of these turbulent geopolitical events and the sorceress kind of storyline. So this is really well done, and it's one of the reasons that I feel the game is so artistic in its construction. It utilises a drum-tight structure and pace instead of giving us you know, again, you know, a long preamble or, you know, telling us what's going on all the time, you know, we largely find out as we're playing the game at the same time that Squall does. The timing and the layered nature of the intertwining narratives is also perfect in my opinion. For example, the interspersing of current events with seemingly random dream sequences wherein we become Laguna. This dual narrative isn't really something that we've seen in a Final Fantasy before or since, and I think everyone, when they first played through, you know, the sequence on the train to Timber, got that surprise and a sort of chilling excitement when Squall and co. realise that they're having the same dream. I personally found that a really gripping story and it left me wondering, you know, are these events taking place at the same time as Squall and co.? You know, what's the connection? Where are these people? You know, and I just think it concluded brilliantly when not only does Alone tell you what's happening and give us clarity, you know, as to that, but also when we get to meet Laguna in Estar near the end of the game and it's the true point of synergy between these, these tangential plot lines. In terms of narrative, in a lot of ways I also see Shakespeare in Final Fantasy VIII, and I know this is quite a bold claim, but even whilst all these terrible and weird events are starting to take shape, and the tragical themes are being explored by our characters, there's still a scope for comedy, and rather than cutting the warring parties of Garden and Galbadia into good and bad, and black and white, a concerted effort is made to humanise you know, our enemy, you know, the Galbadian soldiers, and this for me kind of echoes Shakespeare's managing to capture the full spectrum of human emotion which he you know is famously kind of um, considered to have done so we have characters like Biggs and Wedge and these two somewhat kind of hapless Galbadian soldiers really serve to humanize the war effort and the plight of the people on both sides of the fence you know every time we see them they're sort of bemoaning orders from their superiors and reluctantly fighting against Squall and, and Squall and co until right near the end where they actually quit the army and decide to do something else with their lives these two soldiers, in the three or four fleeting interactions we have with them, serve to lighten the mood and really show the plight of, you know, in this universe, I suppose, the working man. You know, the guy who, living in a militarised state like Galbadia, can only really guarantee himself a good living by joining the military. And it's a testament to Square that such characterisation can actually be realised in just a couple of conversations with two really minor characters. On this note, digressing slightly, I think there's another brilliant example of this, which is the, the soldier who guards Vinza de Ling on the train from Timber. We see him trapped by his orders and consistently fearful that, of you know demotion, and he's always fretting that he can no longer provide for or propose to his girlfriend. Again, this is just a mere moment of game time, and it's not exactly something that Square had to do to progress the game's story. It wasn't a, you know, a necessity. But just by being, just by including it, it added such a great dimension to the world and story. And yeah, I, re I think it really encourages us to care or at least appreciate the machinations of the, you know, the politics of this world and how it has a knock-on effect, right down to the insignificant soldier who, 
who now is kind of posited as something much more than just some random enemy who gets killed in two hits. You know, we actually sort of understand it from their perspective as well. And it's just a great, you know, little addition. In terms of gameplay, Final Fantasy VIII, I think, is really quite unique because it's one of the only examples of a Final Fantasy game where all aspects of the game are cohesive and tie back in to one another and tie back into the story. So, for example, where in other Final Fantasies, in fact, all Final Fantasies I can think of, really, are partitioned up into the field screen, the battle screen, the world map screen, for example. And these are relatively autonomous and, you know, they have their own gameplay elements and that's, that's fine. Final Fantasy VIII, however, it makes a concerted effort to break down the boundaries between these respective modes, particularly between battle elements and, the, you know, the storyline, the main story arc, and it gives a degree of relevance to all aspects of how the game is played out. So taking one of the more controversial aspects of this game, the junctioning system, this influences characters' stats and determines what magic and guardian forces and, you know, that sort of thing, what you can use in battle. But it's not solely confined to the battle system. It's actually a significant plot device that's used in the world of Final Fantasy VIII. And, you know, we have the junction machine alone created by Dr. Odin, and this prompts the entire sort of Ultimecia storyline and her ability to travel through time. The gameplay is also fused by the introduction of Guardian Forces, not only into the storyline, which they are quite intrinsic to, you know, the storyline and the idea of memory in this game, but also we see them, you know, more often than we have done previously on the field screen and, you know, the boss fights that we undertake with them to, to acquire them. So, for example, you know, Ifri, who we fight right at the beginning of the game, you know, we see him on the field screen, we actually talk to him and interact with him. And the same goes for Odin and, and Cerberus, who are the ones that I can, you know, remember off the top of my head. And, oh, yeah, and uh, Bahamut, of course, as well. So, you know, everything everything seems to be accounted for in Final Fantasy VIII. Nothing is divorced from anything else. And the entire package of the game is delivered in a sound and cohesive way. You know, I, I find it really quite baffling that nobody in Final Fantasy VII bothered to draw attention to the fact that they were summoning a thunder god called Ramu. I mean, that's not something that you just sort of ignore, you know. Um, and, of course, you know, there is the Materia storyline and, you know, Ramu is, you know, Materia. But... You know, I, I just feel that Final Fantasy VIII kind of legitimizes and ties everything together a lot more, um, a lot more nicely than than other other instalments of this series. Now, the gameplay of Final Fantasy VIII and the whole junction thing is relatively controversial, uh, but on you know, for my part, I actually really like the gameplay mechanics and the introduction of the junctioning and the draw system. I reacted quite positively positively towards it, and although the draw system wasn't perfect, the whole idea of junctioning demanding precedence over leveling and you know magic being numerical and a stock thing as opposed to a you know a, a mp thing uh, I, I i just really quite liked that i felt it was a breath of fresh air from you know what we'd had you know before the learning of abilities from junction gf such as item and magic refinement was also really cool and to be honest the only real gripe i had in terms of gameplay with this entire game was the weapon upgrade system i'm not sure why but just on a personal note, I, I'm someone that loves an abundance of choice, so having five or six upgrades on an existing weapon, rather than having the option to buy many dozens of new swords like in Final Fantasy VII or Final Fantasy IX, uh, I was a bit put out by the fact that, you know, we only have, you know, four or five upgrades for any respective weapon. However, that said, I can really appreciate what a great side quest potential this made for the game, where you had to traverse the world and get into battles and, you know, to discover the relevant items to create this upgrade. So it did add a degree of longevity to the game and uh, make for a really relevant and uh, cohesive side quest, so, so that was pretty great. Okay, let's go ahead and talk about the characters. Now, I'm going to talk about the main party first, and I'd like to note the significance of these characters as orphans, which I noted earlier. I feel that this helps propel one of the more significant themes of this game, uh, which is the journey of the self in relation to the world, and you know the need to find a place within it. So, as a, as a, as a plot device, I feel it was a great decision to make these characters orphans because it really drives home this theme, and in each of the characters at a given point in the game we see them having to confront this fact, you know, their, their, their truest self, the orphan self, and the fact that they have grown up inherently alone. This, what this does is allows us to kind of have a, a subtle character arc for each character, and you kind of need to pay a bit of attention to really, you know, notice it or grasp it, because, 
you know, so much prominence is given to the the Squall and Rhinoa thing, and of course the the um, the Laguna and Alone storyline. But I feel that in having no parents and in having this void where there should have been family and guidance, each individual in the main party has grown up insecure and essentially alone, and as a coping mechanism to sort of con- conceal the fear and ambiguity of who they are. Each has constructed a persona for themselves that is in binary opposition to, you know, who they actually are, you know, their deepest insecurities. So this sounds a bit abstract and wayward. So I think probably the best thing is to take a brief look at these characters and and the traits of these characters against what happens to them in the story. So Quistis is first introduced to us as an authority figure and she takes us through the fire cabin during our seed exam. She comes across as very self-assured, instructive and in charge. However, we very quickly find that she is insecure about her prowess as an instructor and about her reliability in this role, and very quickly her facade unravels as she loses her instructor licence and cedes control and leadership, which you know kind of goes over to Squall for pretty much the rest of the game. We also have a very fleeting glimpse of her as inherently indecisive. She notes later on that she was unsure about her feelings towards Squall, whether they were emotional or professional or something in between. So we quickly come to see Quistus as someone hiding behind a mask, and it is through companionship with the others that she gradually reconciles herself to the world and to her place within the garden and her place you know, within you know, the community. On a similar note, we have Irving. Now, Irving's facade is a little more obvious, and immediately he's introduced to us as this gun-toting misogynistic ladies man and he tries really hard to come across as you know detached and cool and someone that knows what's going on he's pretty much you know comic relief to this end for the first part of the game and he strikes us all as a sort of emotionally vacuous idiot but this is Irving's cleverly constructed facade in action and we find during the idea assassination mission that he is overwhelmed by sentiment and has a real concern about taking another's life you know, granted, Irving is the only one in the group who knows Adia is matron at this point, but this is just, you know, sort of detail. He explains to the party how he acts all cool, and on the outside he's always sort of, you know, trying to come across this way. But inside he's all, he always seizes up at the decisive moment, and this belies his real character. We also see a clear affection for Selfie develop over the course of the game, and then of course there's also his basketball scene where he reveals a much more caring and thoughtful aspect to his character entirely. I actually really quite like Irvin because, you know, as a, as a general rule, as a person, it's quite hard to admit that you're both a coward and a dick, but he does this with grace and goes on to become quite a valued asset of, of the main party. Now, moving on to Selfie, she strikes me as someone who is one of the most insecure members of the party and people in this game, and the reason I say this is because she tries so hard she tries the absolutely hardest out of everyone to be happy at all times and early on we we do see cracks in this facade we see fleeting glimpses of her internal struggle for example when she's looking out of the the train window on the way to timber you know she's sort of staring out the window and she asks squall some pretty somber questions and this develops further at uh, trabia where of course uh, we see her home you know, get destroyed. There, there's also a repeated reluctance throughout the game to get close to Irving, and indeed this this confusion is perhaps a product of being emotionally detached, uh, particularly romantically, to another person. You know, the idea of having someone else in your life is, is profoundly foreign to her. And yeah, I, th- I think Selfie is kind of a, a, you know, almost a manic, you know, a bipolar sort of person and a kind of psychological minefield, really. Now, Zell, uh, to some extent, Zell is one of the most well-adjusted people in the group. He was adopted into a good family, so he has roots and a role model in the, the uh, form of his soldier grandfather. So, as such, you know, he's, he's well adapted to the world, and when the revelation comes during the basketball scene that Zell realises he's an orphan, he actually brushes it off with relative ease and states, you know, that he had a good upbringing and, you know, he's, he's kind of um, thankful for that. However, despite this, Zell still exhibits a certain coveting of his character, his true character, and he masks a profound sensitivity with this impulsive and often, you know, he's very quick to get physical in his his response to things. And everything about his character, right down to the facial tattoo, bespeaks a self-assured, strong and optimistic young man. But we still have people like Cypher, for example, reminding us throughout the game that Zell is a a chicken wuss, as he puts it. 
But I think, you know, what, what he means by this is the fact that Zell is really quite sentimental and he really respects the rules and authority. And I think this comes across numerous in numerous ways. Firstly, there's the the revolution. The, the the revelation, you know, comes that he wants to make a gift of Squall's ring to Rhinoa. The second is that in his room in Balan during the Galbadia occupation, if Zell was in the party, we go up to his bedroom and we find out that he has a shrine dedicated to the memory of his grandfather, uh, who was his, his inspiration for becoming a fighter. And again, it's a sentimental nod to his true character. And lastly, and this is more you know, a general observation, but if Zell was in the party during any given mission or plot development point, he's always trying to help, you know, he's always, you know, taking responsibility of Idia or Matron, he's always trying to help Squall, and, you know, he's kind of like the character of Watts as well, in that he's always on hand at certain points of the game to relay information, such as, you know, for example, when you're on the way to Esthar or in the Deep Sea Research Centre. I mean, in, in general, I, I really do like most of the characters in this game, apart from possibly Selfie, who gets on my nerves a bit. I, I feel that their traits complement one another and make for an interesting party to proceed through the story with. And this also sets a unique precedent for the series, because although Final Fantasy is usually a motley crew of characters you acquire at different points of the game, all with differing, differing you know, um, objectives and ideas and story arcs, in Final Fantasy VIII, you acquire the entire party relatively early on, and you all have the same mission agenda, and all come from the same place. So I can understand why some people may not have liked this, because it narrows the, the scope for diversity and the potential for character development. But I think it was necessary, because the grander themes of this game, such as time and the existential self, are actually really quite massive concepts that required prominence and a focal point. And I think not only does Squall and Rhinoas, well, Squall really serve as, as the focal point for this, I think that the fact these characters around him are all orphans and all have the same fundamental issues at reconciling themselves serves as a sort of ripple effect and, you know, they sort of kind of uh, orbit around Squall to really embellish and drive these themes home. Now, OK, on that note, actually, let's let's go ahead and talk about Squall because he is clearly the main protagonist of this game around which you know all these all these uh, all the party members sort of hinge you know he progresses to become you know the leader quite quite quickly and on on a general note of school i think during concepting and early in development there was there must have been a very real concern about distinguishing this new protagonist from cloud uh, from from final fantasy 7 and i feel personally that this was very well achieved right down to the aesthetics the attitude and of course the trademark weapon of squall I, I think the Gunblade is a very cool concept and I'm not sure where else they could have gone because of course the protagonist's weapon is almost as significant as the protagonist himself in a lot of ways and after creating something as iconic as the Buster Sword you know there's, there's you, you know I, th I find it very interesting about where they could have potentially gone with that but I think the Gunblade certainly stands out because in this quasi steampunk futuristic universe that fuses you know, sorceresses and sort of this feudal European sort of history with the undertones of, um, well, the overtones, I should say, of profound technological advancement. Blending blending a sword with a gun, it kind of crystallises, in a sense, the sort of universe that we're operating in. So it does make for a very good, iconic protagonist weapon. The, uh, the characterisation of Squall, right down to his name, is also very interesting. I mean, if we consider his inner turmoil, and look at the, the etymology of his name, Squall, which is, of course, a storm at sea. This is like a, a metaphorical label, if you like. His name is a label for the turbulent nature of his psyche, his, his inner self. But I also find this doubly interesting when contrasting Squall, Squall with Cypher, for example, uh, who he shares a very interesting symbiotic sort of relationship with that I'll, I'll go on to talk about later. And basically, we note of Cypher that he utilises fire elements all through this game, Thus is, you know, a binary opposition to the water element that, you know, Squall is, of course, associated with by his name. And also on this note, and this is what drives home the fact that this was very deliberate on Square's part, is it's interesting to note that Cypher's friends, Reijin and Fujin, are named after the earth and wind gods of, you know, Japanese Shinto mythology. So through this subtle congregation of nature's four elements, we can see Squall as water has been aligned against the other three you know, um, key elements, and and this sort of further 
emphasises his individuality and his isolation, I suppose, from, from everything else. I also think water is the most fitting element for Squall, particularly posited against the impulsive fire symbolism of Scyther, because in Deus, the Deoist notion of water is its malleability, and to quote a Bruce Lee, yeah, I think it was actually Bruce Lee that said this, but if you put water in a cup, it becomes the cup. And, you know, it's this malleable nature of water. And I think this designs, this defines, sorry, Squall conforming to the position of leadership, conforming to people, and gradually by the end of this game, conforming to the world at large. So it's a very fitting metaphor and, and a great, you know, character. You know, a very subtle, but a, a, a very great characterization, in my opinion. So let's talk about Squall's attitude, because it's a definitive aspect of his character and, you know, a, a defining plot point of the game. Now, first of all, I think Squall, my, my opinion of Squall was definitely tarnished by the rise of the idea of the emo in, in the mid-2000s. And, you know, this whole emo thing sort of commodified and made a joke out of, you know, formative adolescent issues, you know, and a adolescent attitudes, you know, that people have when they when they go through that period of their life. And Squall kind of genuinely has these and embodies these quite realistically. But rather than being, you know, depressed and, you know, sort of conventionally emo as a, as a sort of, as a persona, as a commodity that, you know, a lot of fans now uh, accuse Squall of and don't, they don't like him because of it. Squall's whole attitude actually stems from a very acute and quite realistic childhood abandonment issue. And, you know, taking into account that Squall is an orphan who has prob probably spent, you know, the majority of his young life in care, and during the flashbacks we find him already aloof as a result of what we can probably assume is the death of his parents during the Sorceress War. It's doubly tragic that in his most formative years as, you know, this growing orphan, the most important person to him who is alone, who is sort of this pillar for him, this sort of emotional, you know, pillar of strength, is, is taken away from him or leaves him behind. And this speaks volumes in my eyes and totally rationalises why we find Squall so emotionally blunted and aloof uh, as we do at the beginning of the game. In fact, there is a psychological idea put forward by um, a British psychologist called John Bowlby, and he identifies an extreme reaction to childhood abandonment can be what's called a defensive detachment. And this basically involves individuals attempting to remain completely independent of all relationships and all other people, never risking meaningful attachment again for fear of again you know recurring abandonment uh, so I think you know this this is a very pointed and um, accurate psychological disposition of, of perhaps how Squall is for, 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 for a lot of the game and why on the surface at least he comes across as a almost narcissistically self-involved sort of person I feel this was exceptionally important though and I can understand why people don't like Squall at the beginning of the game and you know understand I mean I don't really like Squall at the beginning of the game but it was so important to make him this this extreme in, in terms of his um, being segregated from people because it allowed for the theme of togetherness and the theme of the existential self to be explored and developed, you know, that much more because he's such, you know, so far on this extreme. You know, by disc three, we see him kind of, we see this massive amount of development in him. And I feel it was a massive success on the part of the writers to to create such a, a, a compelling you know, a plot with him and him and Rhinoa. I mean, if you actually recall the beginning of disc three, where Rhinoa falls into a coma, you are at the orphanage with um, Sid and Adia, and they're basically relaying a lot of important plot information to you, such as, you know, this is where we discover who Ultimecia is, you know, th this is where we first hear the name Ultimecia, and this is where we first hear the, the concept of time compression. And simultaneously, while they're telling us this information, we can see, of course, Squall's thoughts, and Squall's thoughts are completely wandering about Rhinoa. And this is important because not only is it, you know, a plot development point where we find out about the antagonist, but it also shows how Squall's emotional disposition has so thoroughly shifted onto another person rather than himself to the extent that, you know, Squall, who was formerly, you know, the A-star pragmatic soldier mercenary student, is ignoring a mission, mission briefing to, to, to think about someone else. Lastly, I think it's just important to drive home and you know note that Squall is not a depressed person from a psychological standpoint. A lot of people say he's whiny and depressed and you know just a moany teenager, but this actually isn't really the case. He's walled himself up inside a cocoon of self as a defence mechanism, but he's not depressed. He's in fact 
a remarkably pragmatic and logical person that teeters sometimes into anxiety when he's not sure of what course course of action to take, but he's not depressed. So I, I think I just want to um, sort of liberate him from that from that horrible stereotype that people have people have sort of um, thrown onto him. Now I think it would be natural to go on to talk about Rhinoa or Laguna next because they are obviously equally significant protagonists in this game. But in, instead of that, I want to talk about Cipher because, as I, as I briefly mentioned. Cypher shares a very symbiotic relationship with Squall, but he's also un- almost universally overlooked and laughed laughed at for being a sort of weak loser with this sort of dream of his. But I think uh, Cypher, Cypher plays a very important role, and one of the most formative feuds of the game is between Squall, Squall and Cypher, and there's a very significant sort of yin and yang thing going on between these two, um, a binary opposition, and yet an intrinsic coexistence that you know, propels them both forward through this sort of antagonism. And again, you know, this sort of yin-yang thing we can see um, characterised all the way down to, you know, aesthetics and attitude. Where Squall dresses in black, Cypher dresses in white, so quite literally, you know, sort of mimicking a yin and yang. And again, like the the elements that I mentioned earlier, the colours are loaded with the symbolism, particularly if we consider this game from a, a Japanese perspective, which is, a, is of course, you know, the perspective that, that it was constructed in. I mean, in the West, the colour white has always been taken to mean good, and black has always been taken to mean bad. But in Japan, it's sort of the other way around. The highest belt you can achieve in uh, karate, for example, is black, and this signifies uh, being learned, wisdom and strength. White, on the other hand, is the first belt that you have in karate, and this symbolises being a beginner and conveys a certain naivety. And these are traits that I think we can cer- certainly see in the in the personalities of of, of Squall and Cypher. Cypher also takes on an overtly European look and he has very Aryan sort of blonde features and his coat for example is, is covered in European crusader iconography, the, the white and red. And true enough you know he does also aspire to be Adia's knight so there's a very European and chivalric sense of loyalty, loyalty about uh, Cypher. <laughs> it just, it's almost coincidental that he just happens to be fighting for the wrong side. If we look at Square it, you know, digressing on this point, if we look at Square and their reputation for, you know, com- uh, portraying Christianity as an antagonist, you know, for example, in the guise of Yevon in, in Final Fantasy X and uh, Sephiroth, uh, his final form at the end of Final Fantasy VII, he's a very overtly an uh, Abrahamic uh, seraphim angel at the end of VII. We can strongly assume that, you know, the Christian iconography for Cypher as antagonist, again, is, is deliberate too. I'd just like to digress a little further on um, cipher, particularly this the sorceress knight thing, because I, I just find this little aspect of the game brilliant, and I didn't actually realise it until a couple of years ago. But Cipher's dream to be a knight stems from a movie that he saw once. Um, and if you cast your mind back and remember a short dream sequence on disc three, there's a scene where Laguna is starring in a movie, and a, a Ruby Dragon shows up. Uh, and basically, in this scene, Laguna has a gunblade and he's holding it, how Cipher does, and he uh, strikes a remarkably similar sort of. Um, Victory poses Cypher as well. So I think it's strongly indicated that Laguna was in fact the star of the movie, the Sorceress Knight movie, uh, which Cypher saw and became obsessed with when he was a little boy. And I think this is an interesting subtlety to the game, and also funny, because if you think about it, it means that Cypher was obsessed with Squall's dad, but also it ties Cypher in closer to the game's main events than we originally may have thought. You know, there's this sort of fated circle of characters whose destinies are all intertwined and sort of touched by Laguna. And it means that Cypher isn't really just this annoying guy on the periphery of the main action, but he's actually in there and, and inherently a part of this, this whole you know, story arc. Now, Cypher is introduced to us as a mean-spirited and generally you know, quite a bully with a thoroughly kind of Machiavellian streak about him. But it's important that we understand this is not the real Cypher. Again, like the orphans, it's a coping mechanism employed because inside, the real Cypher, just like the others, is sort of scared. He's just this shit-scared sort of orphan, you know. Where the others actually reconcile themselves to reality, however, Cypher goes on to pursue the facade, uh, the constructed persona of the sorceress's knight. And this is only bolstered by the fact that, in my opinion, Cypher remembers and, and knows full well that Adia is matron. I think it's worth digressing into this point, actually, because I've, one thing I've noticed about Cypher is that he seems to hang on to remnants of the past that others don't. So, for example, his hatred of Squall being the main one, but also, you know, his his ongoing bullying of Zell, you know, he calls him chicken wuss all the time, which is evidenced both in his childhood flashbacks and the contemporary events of the game. 
So it's, it's, it's led me to believe that Cypher remembers the past just like Irving does. And on a recent playthrough, I noticed at the end of disc two, just before you fight Adia for the final time, Cypher actually confronts Squall and says, you want to fight Matron after all she's done for us. Now, of course, this revelation comes to the party during the basketball scene, but Cypher wasn't actually there. So I think we can assume that Cypher draws his own conclusions from his own memories about who the sorceress is. And I think, you know, this is bolstered again by the fact he never graduated and became a seed. So perhaps he doesn't use guardian forces and, you know, his memories have remained intact to this end. A final note I want to make on Cypher, because I know I've spoken about him quite a lot. Um, but the events of the ending animation, uh, we see his redemption and reconciliation with the world and his friends. And this was like one of my favourite parts of the ending. Like Squall, Cypher has spent his life and the duration of the game contending a profound inner turmoil, and I just found it great that instead of killing him off or something like that, they showed him fishing with Raijin and Fujin, and it's prudent, I think, that, you know, with this whole fated symbiosis between him and Squall, not only does Squall s smile for the first time in the ending FMV, but so too does Cypher smile for the first time in the ending FMV. So it's just this great kind of conciliation and conclusion for both of these characters, you know, by the end of the game, I think. Now, moving on to Rhinoa. Now, Rhinoa is, of course, the, the love interest in this game, and looked at in a certain way, you know, we can see she's a very conventional uh, female part in a square game. She's very formulaic in that she's a driven young woman, you know, like Yuna, like Garnet, like Terra. She's something of a staple character. But I do like how, in the, the instance of Final Fantasy VIII, this, is, this headstrong nature of hers is utilised as a means of coaxing Squall out of his cloistered emotional state. But aside from this, she, she's not just the, you know, the foil for Squall, the, the, you know, the, the way we get character development out of him. But her own character arc is also interesting, because at the, video, at the beginning of the game, She's pretty much naive about everything, about politics, war and revolution. And she's really just a sort of rebellious, daddy wasn't there sort of teenager who's trying to get back at her father, who's a, who's a general for the Galbadian military. We see that she's somewhat spoiled in the very first instant because her room is very flamboyant and painted pink, you know, in the, in the timber train. And presumably this is done to suit her tastes and signify her immaturity. And she's also referred to, of course, by Zone and Watts as the princess. So Squall understandably finds this, along with her unprofessional demeanour, somewhat frustrating. And this this is good because, you know, this is how Rhino is. She is a very naive person. This hinges, however, this, this, this changes when she naively attempts to trap Adia's power with the Odin bangle in Deleng City. And after she's confronted with the true brutality of, you know, these people that she's facing, she very quickly comes to terms with her own place in the world and how someone like Squall is so much more well-adjusted to this sort of thing than she is. One of the things I also like about her life, um, like Cypher, is she's subtly, you know, drawn into the the main thread, if you like, of, of the game, again, to do with Laguna, um, because, of course, he was in love with her mother, Julia, and then, you know, Laguna runs off, leaves Julia heartbroken, which allows General Carraway to sort of swoop in and, and, and uh, you know, get with her and, of course, produce Rana. So this adds a whole new dimension of fate to Squall meeting her. And it's embellished, uh, not cheesily, I might add, by the shooting star, for example, that they see uh, after the dance sequence. The best aspect of Rhino's role in the game for me is when she falls into a coma and then becomes a sorceress. It seems at this point in the game that things might sticking up, uh, start picking up and getting better between her and Squall. And then we get this total curveball which really throws the story into a new and more tragic direction. When they land the Ragnarok and Rhinoa gets taken away, for example, and then Squall goes kind of crazy and rushes to save her. This is actually a really important part of the game because Squall is a pragmatist and as a soldier who follows orders to the letter. This is an emotional reaction that one just doesn't expect, you know, him to have. You know, he he carried her to Esthar, right, which is one thing, you know, that that's that's not him going against anyone particularly, that's just him kind of being, you know, selfish if you like. But to actively combat authority, you know, he's breaking the law when he goes and seizes her back from Esther. It conveys a real kind of raw emotion. You know, we have all this silly romantic stuff between those two earlier in the game where she's sort of trying to court him and get his attention. But this is very raw, you know, emotive qualities that we're seeing here. And it's, it's absolutely brilliant. It's very powerful. But apart from that, and, you know, Rhino's kind of role in this game, I've, I've not much really else to say about her. 
I think that the romantic ending tied up nicely. I know that there's rumours pertaining to the idea that Squall's dead and this happy ending is nothing but a dreamscape or his imagination. But personally, I, I mean, I think that's nonsense. The time compression story plays out very cohesively uh, and, you know, narrative-wise. And if you actually watch the entire ending, you see Squall and Rhino on the balcony together. You know, it's, it's a resolved ending. You know, there's no doom and gloom. Squall's happy. And as to the idea that Squall died on disc one where Adia fills him with icicles, I mean, I really actually like that theory. I think that's a brilliant theory. And if you haven't heard of it before, I'd go to... Um, uh, squallsdead.com I think it's called and you know it's a really good it, it's very you know very well put forward very intellectually put forward but if true you know this would render pretty much the entire game completely redundant it would make everything to do with Laguna and all that sort of important narrative stuff entirely redundant also and I don't think the, the Squalls Dead theory really accommodates you know, the, the, the Laguna dreamscapes that we have, because, of course, Squall's life is completely divorced from Laguna's life. And, you know, this, this, doesn't, this doesn't quite, you know, you know, fit the mould for me. And although, although it's very good and I find it a very entertaining theory, I just don't think it's really what uh, Square had in mind. And although this game is ambitious and very complex in its themes, I don't think it was going quite that complex and existential um, <laughs> and abstract, really. There's also another popular theory with this game regarding Rhinoa, and this also encroaches on the, the potential for a happy ever after sort of ending. And I'll get into that now by discussing the, the main antagonist of this game, which is Ultimecia. Now, Ultimecia is often a sticking point with fans of Final Fantasy because I find that because she isn't mentioned and doesn't really appear until about halfway through the game, you know, at the end of disc 2, and even after this, she only really appears about three times in the game. There's a degree of ambiguity about her. You know, you know, we don't know much about her, which is probably where all these kind of you know theories are coming from. Uh, but I would refute this by saying that actually, Ultimecia, firstly, she does appear in the in the game quite a lot because she's in the guise of other sorceresses. She's kind of you know controlling Adia. She's controlling Adele, and she is the architect of pretty much everything bad that happens in this game. So she does play a very decisive role in what's happening. And the second reason that she seems to be a, a sticking point for people is because her intentions aren't really clear unless you're kind of paying attention and really kind of reading into it. And I think, you know, to an extent, you do need to have the knowledge from the Ultimania to sort of re really kind of get this. Um, by the way, the Ultimania for this game has been translated and it's available at livestream.net. So if you're interested in kind of digging around and you know, uh, getting to grips with some of the behind-the-scenes stuff and the concepting and, you know, the embellished mythology of this game, you know, it's pretty pretty well translated. I mean, on the surface, Ultimecia's plan seems quite, you know, straightforward for a, for a sort of antagonist, which is, you know, becoming an immortal god sort of thing. But, you know, really boiling it down, I think it's actually much more complex than that, and it's a lot more complex than it sounds. And it's, you know, we could put this down in a lapse of storycraft or translation, but I actually think it's because she's intimidated by the idea of death and the finiteness of being. Ultimecia exhibits signs of what's known as death anxiety, and more specifically existential death anxiety, which is the technical term. Uh, so what this does is, if we are to go with this idea that she suffers from you know, existential death anxiety, it ties all three key themes that I've identified earlier in this talk, the death of course, the finite finiteness of time and issues pertaining to the self which is of course you know uh, death anxiety is is a result of you know your yourself being incapable of of uh, reconciling with the world around you and the, the machinations of the world and the prospect that at some point in time you will no longer be yourself you know as you are you know you're going to die and ultimately can't really get to grips with you know, this idea that, you know, she will one day no longer be. But rather than seeking therapy or going crazy like, you know, us humans that, you know, might suffer from this disorder do in the real world, in the supernatural world of Final Fantasy VIII, where Ultimecia is a sorceress, she attempts to combat this inevitability with uh, time compression. And this is a vehicle towards perpetual life. And it does kind of make perfect sense, you know, the whole time compression thing. Because, I, I mean, I've spoken to people about this before and they got a bit lost around this and they thought it was kind of a lapse in storytelling. But it does make sense. It's a very cohesive and good storyline. And Ultimecia using this as a vehicle to, you know, maintain existence indefinitely, it makes perfect sense. 
And of course, you know, um, we can't forget that Ultimusia is an inherently evil sorceress. So the fact that time compression creates a void wherein only she can exist and basically kind of removes everyone else, it's a vacuum where she can just live. It's basically two birds with one stone for her. Much like my analysis of Squall, the etymology of Ultimusia's name also has a, a degree of uh, symbolism to it and a degree of metaphor attached to it in that it ties in with this concept of time. Because, of course, it is a play on the word ultimate, which is a term for the end of a process or an extreme result of a process. So we're still operating in this time convention. And, of course, the fact that she's the final boss at the end of the game is relevant in that, you know, ultimate is the end of a process, you know, it's the end of the game. So it's still, it's got this time symbolism to it as well. Now, although Ultimisia, okay, she, she is a relatively ambiguous um, antagonist compared to someone like Sephiroth, who has a, a massive amount of character development. But I, I kind of like this because it has developed this interest and, and many fan theories regarding her. The most popular of which is, of course, that you know Ultimisia is actually Rhinoa in the future. Now, I really do like this theory because it offers a very tragic twist to the game, <laughs> um, and you know, with such a cohesive and positive ending with Squall and Rhinoa ending happily, you know, happily ever after, it does leave you thinking, you know, what could have possibly happened, you know, what, what terrible thing could have happened to have this as, you know, the ultimate result. And I like that, and I think it's a very intelligently put forward, you know, theory. Of course, there's a lot of um, aesthetic similarities between these two characters. However, my personal feelings on the matter is that this was probably not the intention of, of the developers, at least, you know, maybe not quite. I think if this theory were to hold up, Ultimisia would, you know, she does share aesthetic similarities with Rhinoa, so she could possibly be, you know, perhaps a distant relative is the only way I can feasibly think uh, of, of this uh, theory as being, um, you know, uh, legitimised. Uh, firstly, we have the, the, the facial similarities and the iconography of the, the angel wings, and it seems very telling to this end that, you know, they are intended to be similar or related somehow. But the, the, the ideas behind why I think, you know, they'd be related and not actually Rhinoa is because the two things that we irrefutably know about Artemisia is that one, she's a sorceress from the distant future, and two, she's feared and hated by the people in her time. Now, for my part, I think it's highly unlikely that Rhinoa is, is someone who's... Well, firstly, OK, let's take Rhinoa out of the picture because, you know, it's, it's, it's distant in the future, OK? So if we consider Squall and Rhinoa having a daughter together, I think it's highly unlikely that, you know, those two and, you know, their party of friends and the optimistic environment of, of Garden is going to be a place where that child's going to have a bad childhood to the extent that they grow up and could become quite psychopathic. I just don't think that that's plausible at all, really. So at a stretch, you know, perhaps a granddaughter or, you know, a very distant sort of blood relative. And I know a lot of people have used Dissidia and, you know, these la these latter instalments of, of the Final Fantasy VIII story to um, sort of promote this theory. And I just, I don't buy into that at all. I think what Square have done, and they've done this with Final Fantasy VII, and it kind of bugs me actually that they do this, is once they get hold, that once they get a whiff of what fans are thinking, they'll they'll pay lip service to it. So for example, Final Fantasy VII was a massive success, so they've been dining out on Cloud and spin-offs for the past, you know, 10 years. You know, I think this is similar with Final Fantasy VIII. They've purposely made the relation the, the similarities between Rhinoa and Ultimisia in these newer instalments. They've made them much more apparent and, and similar on purpose to sort of increase this interest and generate this sort of controversy around it. Because at the end of the day, you know, it sells shit for them. Um, so yeah, I mean, I, you will notice that I haven't mentioned uh, Kingdom Hearts or Dissidia or anything like that because I consider these games as standalone titles. Um, and yeah, I don't, I don't really... I, I don't really kind of operate out, outside of, of the confines of, of this game because for me this is the original, this is how it was in, originally intended and anything they've done since is uh, an effort to sort of capitalise and, you know, sort of make money on it. Which is a terrible thing to say really, but, and I don't want to get into it, but uh, I think like a lot of people, um, 
I've been I've been slightly let down by by Square in recent years. So anyway, okay. So uh, just tying up Ultimisia. Ultimately, you know this this theory of Ultimisia being Rhinoa, it's not something that we're ever likely to get proper clarity or confirmation on. As you know, people have literally torn this story apart and torn the Ultimania apart, trying to get a hint at truth either way. And as such, I mean, the, the, the way I've taken it is instead of letting the ambiguity of it drive you kind of insane, I, I just leave it down to how optimistically you'd like this story to tie up. For my part, personally, I like the happy ever after because to have Squall start off cloistered and traumatised and then to, to conclude at some point in the future with Squall having, you know, become traumatised yet again for having a psychopathic wife, you know, whatever happens... I, I just don't think it makes for a very fair or, you know, it's not very conducive to a well-resolved story if, you know, it begins terribly for him and then ends, you know, ultimately terrible for him. OK, I'm going to have to skirt over a, a few sub-characters here that I really like. Um, I'm going to tie up and talk briefly about Laguna and co, as their significance is, you know, it can't, it can't be understated really in looking at this game, and they are great characters. So, you know, I'm going to have to miss off people like Adia and Sid, both of whom I really like and alone. But to be honest, they're very straightforward characters and they are, they're almost just set pieces in the storyline that help tie things together and compels the story to move along. So, yeah, I mean, I like them. And, you know, I wanted to talk about uh, some of the cooler stuff like the Moombas and, you know, those little nice little things that are unique to Final Fantasy VIII. But, you know, they're cool and I have no sort of gripes with them at all but there's 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 not much there's not really much else to say about them apart from you know they're good additions to the cast and they help you know tie tie the game and the, and the story and the the atmosphere really of final fantasy together so okay let's t let's talk about laguna now despite being present for less than a quarter of the game this guy is a remarkably significant character that influences or indirect indirectly touches on much of the events that transpire to name just a few there's his inspiring of Cypher to become the Sorceress's Knight through the through the movie he, he, he was in. His love for Rhinoa's mother, Julia, which ties him indirectly to Rhinoa. The weird relationship he has with those little orange moon bars um, who go on to build a statue of him as a side quest in, in the Shumi village. His guardianship of Alone. And of course, most importantly, his being Squall's father, to name but a few. He's accountable for a massive amount of this game, and that's what makes this storyline so so fantastic everything is tied together so neatly and in a lot of ways laguna is more significant you know perhaps maybe you know than, than squall and the contemporary party that we play as and really to to get all these these subtleties of him you need to really be participating with the story and paying attention to what's happening now although it's never outrightly said that you know laguna is squall's father I love the sort of references they make to this, not just in terms of narrative, but also in metaphor and symbology. Again, Laguna is the Italian root word of lagoon, and this refers to an isolated body of water. So this, is, this of course, establishes a connection between him and Squall with, on an elemental level. You know, but where Squall is named for a turbulent body of water, Laguna is named for a calm, tranquil sort of water. And the fact that a lagoon is isolated from the sea too, it refers specifically to an isolated body of water. This perhaps nods at Laguna's geographical and physical detachment from the contemporary events of the game. And of course, you know, his son Squall, who he doesn't meet until, you know, right near the end of the game for the first time. So this makes for sound symbolism regarding these two characters and the way the, the plot is structured in general, uh, you know, because it, of course, confides him largely to separate events that take take place in the past. And it's a testament, again, to Square really paying attention to this, this sort of detail and this, these intricacies. And, you know, you have to, well, firstly, have a, have a grasp of etymology, I suppose. But, you know, you know it's, it's, it's just these, these sort of... Um, these symbolic elements, you know, I, I love this sort of thing personally. I think, you know, it shows such a degree of thought that goes into into the whole shaping of the world and the narrative and, you know, this idea of um, of fate, you know, really, that I think permeates Laguna's character very, very much so. Now, it's hard to paint Laguna in a bad light because he's such a great character, but his impulsive, almost to the degree, degree where he's sort of a dumb, sort of optimistic guy, it really does leave a trail of chaos in its wake. You know, he saves F Esfar for a, from an evil sorceress, and he's a very kind of righteous sort of guy. But by the time we actually start the game as Squall, you know, in contemporary time, he's broken the heart of both 
Julia and Rain and left them. He's deafened his best friend by throwing him off a cliff and he's abandoned his un unborn child, which, okay, admittedly, we'll give him that one. He didn't know that until much later. Uh, this said, I do really like that Laguna is a sort of bros before hoes kind of guy. I don't mean to sound crude with that, it's the only way I can really think about terming it. But it was really needed to counterbalance the overtly romantic relationship of Squall and Rhinoa, which was, you know, a relationship thing, that was a love thing. So, you know, if, if Laguna were to end happily ever after with Julia or Rain, for example, it would make for quite a trite, boring storyline because everyone's falling in love. However, this wasn't the case. He has this camaraderie with Kiros and Ward that runs very deep and demands precedence over pretty much everything else in his life. You know, they, they, are, they are posited in this game as each other's reason for being, which ties again to relationships as an antidote for, you know, this, the existential self and the crisis of the self and finding a reason to be in the world. You know, Kiros, Ward and Laguna have, have that relationship with one another. So yeah, it kind of balances nicely against Squall's party and, you know, because Squall's party of the present, you know, as I mentioned, they're orphans and they have this internal crisis going on. They, they're not old enough. They haven't worked this out for themselves yet. So having this, this break point with the, the dream sequences where, where we have Laguna's party that are sure of themselves, they're confident of their place in the world and also, you know, perhaps most importantly, provide great comic relief and effect uh, from, from the more, you know, dramatic elements of, of the present. This is just a great plot line to, to run in tandem and great characters to have run in tandem with, with some quite serious themes. I think it's summed up best by uh, Kiros when he goes to visit Laguna in Windhill where he states, uh, life's no fun without you around for entertainment or something like that, which really, you know, it kind of uh, crystallises the, the idea of these three quite well. Now, for his part, Kiros is an awesome sub-character. He and Ward, much like Raijin and Fujin, serve as great counterparts to the more significant character in the group. And through their interactions, it really helps develop our idea of who Laguna is. Indeed, if we look at the etymology of their names, Kiros is, well, it seems to be a derivative of the Latin Kairos, which uh, is basically Kiros with an A in it. Um, but this loosely translates to opportunity or opportune moment. Similarly, Ward, who... Um, of course, ward is a more contemporary word, which is a word for guardian, and I think these two words neatly surmise the traits of these three characters and how their story unfolds throughout the game, because of course they are they are chances, but they also sort of look after one another as well. I think what's most also significant about these two is that, unlike some, some sub-characters in other games who have been pretty irrelevant, and, okay, for example, uh, Biggs, Wes and Je uh, Biggs, Wedge and Jesse from Final Fantasy VII, uh, you know, for for maybe the first quarter of of disc one, you know, these are quite important sub characters. But to be honest, I mean, they elicited zero emotional response from me at all. And by comparison, I actually really care about Kiros and Ward and the adventures they have. And I think it's unfair, you know, to consider them solely as satellites of how we perceive Laguna. And it's 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 just kind of a shame that there was no real room in the in the plot for further development with these two. Kiros especially because I just love the way that his pragmatism and logical nature always calls out Laguna on when he's being ridiculous but then you know the strength of his friendship for him always wins out and he goes along with whatever crazy plan Laguna's hatched anyway you know that's a really cool sort of relationship and again you know I like Ward as well but the problem we have with him is that he loses his voice pretty early on in the game and although it's stated by characters numerous times that you know what he's thinking because of his eyes, you know, the the limitations of Final Fantasy and the fixed camera angle, it doesn't allow this to be, you know, sort of capitalised upon, you know, by by the um, by the development team. So, you know, it's kind of a shame, but we have the idea of these three characters as as a very tight knit group, and you know, that all three of them are, are very funny, which is great. Now, I'm I'm sort of wrapping up here. I don't have much else to say. I've kind of I could talk about this game all day, to be honest, and I'm trying to be as succinct as possible and just highlight, you know, just crystallise my favourite elements of the game. But the final thing I have to mention is, of course, the music. Now, I, I mean, I know people that don't really like Final Fantasy as a Final Fantasy... Uh, don't really like Final Fantasy VIII, sorry, as, as an instalment of this series. Yet they, they all kind of concede that the one redeeming feature of this game for them is the music. I think Yumatsu, Nobu Yumatsu just went above and beyond what we've seen before, not just in terms of quality, because of course the flat MIDI sound of all games prior to this was traded in for 
you know the, the you know the technological advancements that were available in 1999 but also this proves for me to be one of Yumatsu's more compositionally brilliant outings i mean looking at the most famous tracks from this game we can probably say things like uh, Liberi Fatali, which is the opening FMV soundtrack, and also Waltz for the Moon, which was uh, used for the widely publicised dance scene, which came out as a as a demo, and you know was, that was widely pushed before Final Fantasy VIII's release. And don't get me wrong, these scores are absolutely brilliant. I really like them. But for me, Yumatsu's genius comes from his ability to write a real video game score. And what I mean by this is Liberi Fatale is very epic and cinematic and it builds and hits its crescendo and we're just in awed by the awesomeness of this piece of music. However, the real plight and also the real skill of the video game composer, as opposed to the film score composer, is that where a film score composer can write a piece of music that will fill an emotive minute or two of film, you know, maybe five minutes of film, the video game composer needs to write a piece of music that will repeat and it will repeat and repeat, and yet still have to captivate and maintain an interest and engagement for the player. So, I mean, looking at it this way, this must be a tremendously hard thing to do. And I think Yumatsu's genius really shines through in the compositions that are intended, you know, purposely intended for prolonged in-game missions or engagements. So, rather than kind of whittling on like this, just to offer a selection of what I feel are the best examples of music in this game. Firstly, I love, there's a piece called The Stage is Set, and I think you first encounter it during the Adia assassination mission, and it's such a brilliant piece of music because it evokes a real sense of military decorum and urgency. And, you know, right down to the instruments, you know, we have the marching snare drum and it's complemented by trumpets. So very clearly Yumatsu's intent is apparent in this, and it, it just matches, you know, the scenario you're in the, in the game absolutely perfectly. And, you know, I could listen to that on repeat for a very long time. I mean, I do listen to the... The OST quite often, and this is one of the um, one of my favourite pieces on it. You know, the landing is another great piece, but again, this is very film score inspired, and you know, we we see it for the FMV where we land on Dolly Beach, and it's great for that. Uh, Premonition, which is used for the sorceress boss fight scene, um, the Oath, which is fantastic, starting up, which is a short short piece, which is fantastic, and the compression of time which is you know absolutely brilliant. I mean, I could go on and, and talk about all these pieces of music because I, I love this entire OST. The only piece I don't really like that much is the Esther theme. But even, even there, I can sort of understand why Yumatsu did it because Esther is so kind of futuristic and technologically advanced and divorced from any semblance of what we're used to. You know, maybe it demands this sort of slightly offbeat, kind of obscure sort of soundtrack. So yeah, I mean that, that's that's pretty much all I have to say about the the music. I I think it's absolutely brilliant, and I'm glad that you know they're doing the distant worlds, um, they're doing the distant worlds albums and and tours. So we actually have real kind of orchestral instruments backing these up now. And yeah, I mean of course you know I mean Yumatsu's genius is universally acknowledged for his work on this series, and it is all sort of great. But for me, his work on A is just the jewel in the crown, if you like, of of his career. Okay, so I've endeavoured to sort of touch on everything I find fascinating about this game as briefly and concisely as possible. I mean, the truth is I could pontificate on Final Fantasy VIII all day and really get into the theories and the psychologies of its story and characters, but it's something that would inevitably fail on a medium like YouTube where succinctness is kind of favoured, really. I mean, if, if you've actually got this far, kudos to you, and I really appreciate that. But in all, for me, uh, Final Fantasy VIII is a profound experience, and... It has so much meaning and metaphor undulating beneath the surface of what you might otherwise just mistake for a standard coming-of-age JRPG. It's the likes of which will never warrant a remake, in my opinion, and will never see it again, which is a real shame. But the fact it exists at all is a testament to how Square at times can really get it right. And for me, you know, one of the best gaming experiences that I've, I've had to date.